Subsaber und Wavy, a typical person right here, but cruel video game called Fear and Hunger. Let's track it. Here is how an early run of Fear and Hunger may go for you. You begin in the game's opening courtyard. Show me. With the sound of barking ringing ominously in the distance, you enter the dungeon of Fear and Hunger. After a few moments of eerie silent exploration bro the first impression directly is janky as creepy rpg maker game you encounter like i, I can already see the interface pursued Show me. by a massive ogre who traps what is he censoring what do <laughs> in battle before immediately cutting off your left arm you are asked to predict a coin toss, which you fail, resulting in your character being beaten into unconsciousness. But this yes. is not game over. No. You awaken to the smell of rotting flesh. Now, what missing the heck? every limb except your right arm, which you use to drag your destroyed body along with, emerging in a corridor of decaying corpses. What the you scramble in the darkness for something, anything, and unfortunately for you, you find it. You have a bad feeling about this. Decapitated hit spawns. Okay. You encounter a grotesque floating head. He laughs at you. He mocks you. He begins chanting. And suddenly, he is no longer what concerns you. Because out of the darkness behind him, Something is approaching. Some gigantic <laughs> being is drawing closer and closer. Each turn, probably. Every turn. Yep. You attack. It does nothing. You beg. It does nothing. Finally, the creature looms over you. You are crushed with great pressure. Damn. The first time this happened to me, I thought, wow, fuck this broken game. I hate <laughs> this. I would rather play literally anything else. Yeah, it seems like this one, like, insanely unfair game where you just need that perfect path to succeed. Like, um, this is an insanity if you do this to yourself. Like, a run, if you do it perfectly, could probably last a few hours, but people will take, like, 20 or something to complete the game, I think. I then like it looks insane from the beginning, at least. Destroyed my entire life. When I am playing newer releases, I think about this game. When I am trying to select dinner at the supermarket, I think about this game. When my wife tries to tell me that the amount I think about this game is affecting our marriage, yep. I think what the about hell? this game. I hate this game. And... I love it. Fear and Hunger is this bizarre mishmash of different genres, because it's different. some geniusly counterintuitive game design. But that only becomes obvious if you can push through the game's grueling opening hours, something a lot of people have not done. Fear and Hunger releasing in 2018, where outside a small, rabid fan base localized mainly in Russia and Eastern Europe, the game went no surprise, man. unnoticed for nearly half a decade. Until last October, like it's always uh, the most depressing players is, uh, who love games like this. It's insane. When I and other content creators began to notice it, but with barely a thousand reviews on Steam, this still feels like a game languishing in obscurity. Fear and Hunger doesn't even have its own Wikipedia page. Even Book Bumble has its own Wikipedia page. B Bumble. So I hope the purpose yeah. of this video is clear we must destroy the book bumble wikipedia page my goal here today is to show you what this game is and to do that properly i'm going to have to pull back some of its mysteries but i promise it's worth it no matter what fear and hunger may resemble there is nothing like this a game so obtuse and jagged and captivating but dark fences yeah i guess it's cruel and so to start, 
I'd like to explain exactly what I mean by that. Difficulty in modern game design has been broken down into two major categories. Games that are challenging and games that are punishing. Games that are considered challenging are ones that require a high degree of skill in areas like decision making, pattern recognition, timing, strategy, etc. Think games like Ikaruga, Celeste, Devil May Cry, or competitive fighting games. Any yeah. game where the act of surviving or succeeding is considered hard. Punishing games, on the other hand, don't generate their difficulty by being difficult but through the penalty that's inflicted on the player when they do fail. So take a game like Hades. If Hades let you indefinitely retry from where you died, I'd argue most people would beat it an hour or two and probably not think about it again. But by punishing death through forcing the player to start from the beginning, this is how the game generates its difficulty, as well as letting it build its story and gameplay around that idea. Challenge is about your ability to overcome an obstacle, punishment is the penalty for when you fail. And a game can be hard by being either one of these things, but I would argue only becomes cruel by being both. And Fear and Hunger is the cruelest game I have ever played. The reason this is important is not difficulty for difficulty's sake, but the nightmarish and captivating experience fear and hunger shapes through that cruelty. A cruelty you can feel as soon as the game begins. Hey, uh, I just want to say that because I have validation issues and seek approval through unreasonable means, I play the game on the harder... Terror and Starvation difficulty, no. and if you want the experience I'm about to spend the rest of this video describing, I advise you do the same. Okay. Nice transition. You start the game by picking one of four characters, your only guidance being that there is a infamous knight named Lagarde who disappeared into the dungeon of fear and hunger, your goal being to locate Lagarde and escape the dungeon. Something you can actually do in under an hour. In theory. In theory. From here, the game drops you into its opening courtyard. No tutorial, no direction, just you and the dungeon's gaping abyss. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? You are immediately mauled to death by a pack of ravenous dogs. Yep. Hear that knocking sound? That is the sound that will greet you every time you die and are booted back to the game's opening menu. It is the sound of a failed run, of lost progress, and of having to start again. You will hear it a lot. Unless you're playing as anyone except Knight, who is objectively the best character in the game, the dogs are a nightmare that will shred your health in a couple of attacks and inflict multiple status effects, even initiating their own coin flip attack, which if you lose, you die. Yep. Soon, you will learn that fighting the dogs is not a reliable option. So what if instead you just escape into the castle and you know, if you if you time it just right, there's this corner that the dog's AI will catch on and hey, you've Easy. done it. You found a reliable way to survive the dogs that you can now use in every playthrough moving forward. Oh, oh God, oh. no, what? Where's the, but how am I supposed no. to? No, no, random generated areas are horror. It was disgusting in both games. <laughs> yeah. yeah, see, while the structure of Fear and Hunger's larger map stays the same, the subsections of that map switch between different handcrafted layouts. Meaning, even the shit you can rely on, you cannot rely on. The dogs Never. feel so random and unfair and cruel, and I really couldn't blame someone for walking away at this point. But, remember when I said there was no tutorial in Fear and Hunger? There actually is, and it's already started. You just don't know it yet. See, while the main entrance will nearly always result in a conflict with the dogs, there's actually this sneaky little side passage. And while it's nowhere near as inviting as the main gate, it leads down into a set of dark stairs that the dogs will not follow you down. A better way. This, this is your reliable path forward. 
That is a much bigger deal than it sounds. But for now, I want to concentrate on where this stairway leads. Down into a cramped basement crawling with eerie tentacled monsters. There's also this big door with a crow on it. I don't know what this is. I, it doesn't matter. Uh, anyway, the uh, octopi. Whom the basement's tight corridors will force you into conflict with. However, the these creatures are nowhere near as dangerous as the dogs. And because of that, this is where we can start to learn about fear and hunger's combat. The central mechanic of which is its limb dismemberment system. Rather than choosing to attack a single enemy in fear and hunger, you instead attack their specific limbs. Okay, this piece by piece. Enemy being broken into its left, right, and central tentacles, as well as its head. But the thing is, an enemy doesn't just get one turn. Each of these limbs has its own attacks, which it will use on its own individual turn. Meaning, oh. you're not fighting one enemy, but several. This applies to every enemy in the game. <laughs> nice. Your options being to attack each of the octopus's limbs one by one, or go straight for the head and knock that fucker out. This is the correct option, unless you're playing as the dark priest whose weak little arms can't even land a proper kill shot. Upon defeating your first tentacled monster, you will gain something that will change your entire perspective of fear and hunger. Nothing. Nothing. No items, no experience, no level up. Unlike practically every other game with RPG elements, you cannot grind past a problem. You could kill every octopus in the basement and the dogs will be exactly as dangerous. That's interesting. And worse, the very next enemy you encounter will body you even harder than the dogs. Okay. It's, <laughs> it's easy to feel like you're not making any progress, that this game doesn't make sense. But Maybe the, try avoiding them. The thing is, <laughs> I don't know. You are, and it does. While you may not have gained any stat increases or material advantage, think about what you've actually learned. One, there are enemies that you will not be able to overcome. Two, the most obvious path isn't always the way forward. Three, headshots are the only reliable way to take down enemies. And four, there is no inherent advantage in winning most battles. It might not sound like a lot, but these four lessons are how the game tutorializes you. They are the building blocks that will prepare you for the entire rest of the game. And now that you have them, you're ready to take on the game's first real challenge. The Ogre problem. The guard, or ogre as I like to call them because calling them guards feels like referring to Godzilla as a scaly little fella, are the most common enemy in fear and hunger and your ability to meaningfully progress in this game is going to depend on whether or not you can overcome them. And that might sound easier than it is. See, like the octopi, one good non-dark priest blow to the head will result nice. in a kill shot. But unlike the octopi, you have a very low chance of actually hitting an ogre's head. A chance you can increase by taking out both its legs and causing it to fall over, but it takes three whole turns to do this, during which time the ogre will be free to use his cleaver to yep. cut off your arms, which means no weapons or shields for you for the rest of the game. And if that sounds like a major disadvantage, it is. But don't worry, it's nothing a little child sacrifice can't fix. The ogre's right hand can initiate a coin flip attack, which if you lose, well, we've seen where that leads. This is the ogre problem. How do you prioritize which parts of him to attack without losing the majority of your health or limbs in the process? It's questions like that that the challenge of fear and hunger's combat comes from. And if you think that sounds difficult, oh, 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 oh buddy, oh my oh, sweet no. friend. So, the late game, I guess. With ogres? Well, I like to do it <clears throat> like this. Damn.
me tell you a little story. Throughout Fear and Hunger, there's these bear traps placed around the dungeon, and stepping into one means losing both legs, which effectively ends your run, unless you're willing to crawl through the game on bloody stumps, slowly starving to death as you go insane, which I wouldn't recommend. You could start a YouTube channel to experience basically the same thing. This <laughs> fucked so many of my early runs in Fear and Hunger, so I genuinely cannot undersell the dopamine explosion I experienced when I was caught by a guard and knowing that fighting him would likely lead to the end of my run, I scrambled through my inventory, found a bear trap and thought, fuck it, let's see if this works. And then it did. Huge. The guard now starting the battle with two damaged legs, meaning his head was vulnerable from the first turn. For this single moment, I felt like the smartest man on the planet. And it was amazing not only because the game's difficulty had forced me to think creatively under pressure, but because it led to a broader realization about fear and hunger. This game is not an RPG. It's an immersive sim. If you're unfamiliar, an immersive sim is a game where rather than asking mm. you to engage with its world through one central system, think shooting in Doom, fighting in Street Fighter, or platforming in Mario, immersive sims present you with a variety of systems the best one. options in how to approach a problem. And what I mean when I say fear and hunger is an immersive sim is that if you try to play this game like an RPG, you will get your face punched out. Through like I've your never seen a 2D immersive sim. Like it's not literally one, but it has some aspects, I guess. Ass. But when you start to look at it like an immersive sim, this is where the entire game breaks open. Take, for example, the ogre problem. The bear trap is just one solution. But say you don't have a bear trap. Another option might be to fling a red vial in its face, blinding it, making it way less likely to land those devastating attacks. Less likely. Then have the two options. Less likely have. doesn't mean guaranteed. That's a huge problem with dealing like with multiple cards. Like they're everywhere and just the chance of like losing a limb is devastating, I guess. So why, why using that option that's like not practical, I guess. Already mentioned, systematically cutting off the ogre's limbs, which can work if you have decent enough armor to soak up the ogre's lesser attacks, or just proving what a mad bastard you are to everyone and going straight for the head, which is risky, but if you have the accuracy raising eyeglasses equipped, it actually becomes a viable tactic. Or nice. maybe you don't do any of these things. Maybe you find an assassin's handbook, learn how to make guard skins, meaning that you can disguise yourself from the ogres, letting you just slip by, trivializing an entire part Damn. of the game we've just spent three paragraphs talking about. And it's that last approach particularly that raises a really interesting question in Fear and Hunger. Is the real challenge of this game its battles, or are battles just one small part of something much greater? Because of how we're conditioned to interact with RPGs, it's easy to go into Fear and Hunger assuming that battles are the most important part of it. But as you have the kind of experiences we just talked about, you'll start to understand that way more important than battles is your knowledge and creativity in how to navigate this world. And for me, that revelation started with the bear trap, but it could have just as easily been when I realized that if you have a stick in your inventory when fighting those f***ing dogs, you can actually throw it for them and these lovable no way. lovers will get distracted so you can just stab them to death. But the kicker is that you could have also used that stick to craft an ultra valuable torch item which many areas are completely unnavigable. That is a word, I looked it up without. Oh, okay. So do you really want to spend a stick on this one encounter? Or do you want to save it for later in the game as the encroaching darkness begins driving your party insane? Do you really want to burn that red vial in the eyes of an ogre? Or should you have avoided that fight altogether, saving the vial to burn through a locked door? These are the dilemmas that fear and hunger will constantly hit you with, even when saving your game. As to do so, you'll need to correctly guess a coin flip. A no failure, way. Resulting in, well,
some bad things. However, by holding okay. shift, which the game does not tell you, you can actually spend a lucky coin to flip two coins instead of one. But do you want to waste that coin on a game save or hold on to it to use in a treasure chest for better loot or to up your chances of surviving one of those agonizing instant kill attacks? The more you learn how valuable items actually are, moments like raiding the barrels in the opening courtyard become fucking enthralling as you calibrate and recalibrate your route through the dungeon with each new item. And the more you learn about these systems, the wider and more far-reaching those revelations become. For example, one of the game's major choke points are the mines, filled with dangerous boss monsters and particularly the ghosts which lie at the very end which normal weaponry will not work on. And for me, learning to navigate the mines and the fact that the ghosts are vulnerable to cursed weapons felt huge. But <clears throat> then, 40 hours later, learning that there was actually a secret passage within a secret passage within Very a secret random. passage that just what the bypasses the mines completely, it is the closest I've ever felt to one of those galaxy brain expansion memes. And moments like this are what led to my realization that the real currency of fear and hunger is not stats or items or money, but knowledge. Knowledge. Your understanding of what this world is and how to move through it. This renders an earlier statement of this video that of a foolish child. If you're playing as anyone except Knight, who is objectively the best class in the game, Knight is good. The combination of her armor granting her the highest starting defense as well as her speckable ability fast attack, which once activated lets her make two actions per turn, means nice. she can both soak up the damaging mistakes beginner players will make, as well as giving those players an extra turn to experiment and learn, which makes her a really solid starting option and objectively the best character in the game in combat. However, think of everything we've just talked about and how every advantage of Night is linked exclusively to battles. In terms of navigating Fear and Hunger's world and interacting with it as an immersive sim, Night has no advantages at all. Now, compare that to Mercenary, a character who stats-wise is far weaker than Knight. However, not only can his lock-picking ability allow him to bypass any lock in the game, saving those red vials for flinging in the eyes of people who disagree with you about anime, but he can also be specced with the ability Escape Plan, giving him a much higher likelihood of successfully escaping battles. Nice. As well as the ability Dash, which lets him move at double speed. In any other RPG, the combination of these two abilities would be a convenience. No, it would be fear nice. And hunger, they are game changing, as you will now be able to outrun most enemies and escape easily, even in the off chance they catch you. Trying both the opening dogs as well as the 30 minute time limit you have if you want to reach Lagarde alive. Meaning, there's a time you know limit. What you're doing, you can hit that credits on this game without engaging in a single battle. So then, Knight is the best character, Asterix, in combat, second Asterix at the beginning of the game. Because you see, the Outlander, who can also be specced with Dash, has the highest base attack, letting him hit like a goddamn meteorite, as well as occasionally breaking locked doors, saving on those ultra-valuable small keys but can also be specced with the skill Devour, which lets him ease defeated foes, practically eliminating his hunger heck? mechanic from fear and hunger. And while his starting defense is low, equipping him with the superior armor you're likely to find over the course of the game will eventually make him just as durable as Knight, as well as a late game item that will let him move twice per turn. Meaning, if you can struggle through a particularly brutal early game, you'll be left with a character with all the advantages of Knight, but who can move at double speed, hit harder, and with much easier hunger management. 
And if you think that's crazy, well, let's talk about the Dark Priest. Who yes, yes, yes. still sucks. Yep. Lowest attack, lowest defense, his little body too frail to hold any decent weapons or armor, his necromancy spell doesn't even do anything. I genuinely do not understand what kind of loser picks this. Probably game. good in late game or something like that. Maybe there are some special items you can use specifically with just the necromancer and no one else. Dark priest. Like, what is so empty about your life that this is the character you go with? What all this means is that making a successful run in Fear and Hunger means synthesizing together your knowledge of its monsters and how to overcome them, its map and how to navigate it, the strengths and weaknesses of your character, as well as your understanding of the game's items and creativity in how to use them. But the maddening twist with that last one is that 99% of items in Fear and Hunger are randomized. Nice. You don't even know what <laughs> items you're going to pull from a specific barrel or crate, meaning you don't even know what tool set you're going to be approaching these obstacles with, or what resources you're going to be able to fall back on. And that's a problem, because the longer a run in Fear and Hunger lasts, the more difficult the mere action of just keeping your party alive and sane becomes. Each character has both a hunger and mind gauge that will constantly drain over time, and letting either drop below 50% can have disastrous effects on your run, as characters suffer mental breakdowns and usually nice. winnable battles become party wiping massacres. A full party, meaning you have eight different gauges that will be constantly draining your supply of food and sedatives. And that's alongside the healing items you'll need to recover from the inevitable damage you will take, as well as the constant supply of torches you'll need to maintain. Failure to do so in the wrong area, meaning you'll be left scrambling in the pitch black darkness. Have no idea where to go or what to do as you leak. Literally sand. unplayable. And again, you could just start a YouTube channel to experience the exact same thing. This is all on top of the 30 minute time limit you have to reach. Like Damn. But just two reaction videos. <laughs> as well as the multitude of different and status fine. effects that you'll need specific <laughs> items to cure. And what this all means is that each new step down into the dungeon of fear and hunger becomes this anxiety inducing nightmare that made me realize something. Fear and hunger is not just an immersive sim. It's also a survival horror. The way survival horror games, uh... Horror, you, is through two steps. The first is the steady chokehold they place on your resources, creating yep. this ever-looming threat that you will encounter something that you do not have the help Insane or the I, to like... overcome. That anxiety, leaving the player in an emotionally vulnerable state that the second step can happen. The actual scares, which are now able to tap into something more primal, real, and frightening. Fear and Hunger achieves that first part through its nerve-shredding resource management, but what I was not expecting is how disturbingly it handles the second. When you start Fear and Hunger, most of what you'll encounter are dark takes on fantasy tropes. Ogres, imps, lizardmen, etc. And while it is stressful, it isn't really frightening, but there's a moment for me where that starts to change. The further down the dungeon you go, the more the nature and reality of this place begin to invert in on themselves as the creatures you encounter begin to distort and separate from any established fantasy idea or conventional norm. Like a later enemy that looks like a pregnant mannequin, what the heck? only for the baby to fall out of it onto the floor in front of you and turn by turn slowly crawl to its feet okay. and raise its knife. And I don't even know what to fucking say about the Harvest Men, which don't even attack. They just stand there, reaching their long limbs out and caressing you. Uh, hey, late video edit here. That's not okay. all they do. Do not fight the Harvest Men. I repeat, do not fight the Harvest Men. Also, I'm not even gonna talk about what's in this hut, but uh, it's bad, so enjoy. That survival horror combination, the anxiety inducing resource scarcity followed by the genuinely horrifying things you encounter, it creates a kind of emotional pressure that pushes on you more and more with each new step you take. 
And where the game elevates that pressure into straight up dread is with some fucking amazing atmosphere through sound design. There's one track later on called The Tomb of Gods where you have this chasm-like soundscape but then out of it rises this ethereal voice that sounds just a little too high to be human. Accented by these sinister clinging bells. Mixed in a way that makes it sound Dang. like around the next corner might just be waiting some ancient, terrifying ritual. Just beyond what you can see. Maybe my favorite way the game creates dread through its sound, however, is the track City of Ancients. In it, you can hear a familiar noise. It's that knocking sound we've come to associate with the beginning of the game. But whereas before it sounded close, as if we're standing next to it, now it's distant. Now it sounds distant. Far away and smothered by some gigantic black abyss. And it's such a subtle but incredible way for the game to whisper to you that the place you started is now very far away. And the place you are is infathomably deeper and darker. And what awaits below is only further horror. This all combines to make Fear and Hunger a goddamn masterclass in anxiety and dread. But there is one part of this game where that dread spirals into flat out terror. It is 2 a.m. I am sitting alone on me and my wife's queen sized bed, playing Fear and Hunger on my Steam Deck. I'm exploring an area I've been through half a dozen times when suddenly. A terrifying present has a bit of room. Nice. I've seen this message before and by now assumed it was just the game trying to fuck with me. I ignore it and go about my business when... Hey, wait, I've never seen that enemy before. What? What is the... Oh, okay. Oh, oh, Jesus. Okay. Oh, sweet Jesus. Oh, <laughs> God, what is happening? Oh, my God. You one shots everyone. Yep. This run-devouring monstrosity is the Crow Mauler, a creature who takes inspiration very directly from Silent Hill 2's Pyramid Head. In fact, there's a lot of references in Fear and Hunger, which I don't really get anything out of, but depending on how much you enjoyed the Super Mario movie, you might. Pyramid Head was, in concept at least, a stalker enemy, a dangerous, near-indestructible creature that pursues the player through the game. And I love stalker enemies. The concept of something that bears obeys the rules of this world while hunting you through it is so captivating and terrifying. However, that terror can quickly turn to goofy yeah. irritation if a stalker isn't sufficiently challenging or punishing. This is not a concern you will have with the Crow Mauler. At any point during a battle, he can launch one of several game derailing attacks. He can use his maul to smash the bones of your party, leaving them permanently debuffed. He can rip out their eyes, causing them to go blind. Pray this does not happen to your main character. And most frighteningly of all, his peck attack will without a coin toss kill one of your party members. Encounters with the Crow Mauler are nightmares. Massacres in which you and your party hobble away from. Beaten, broken and drained of resources. And while you can avoid him, he has a tendency to burst through a wall and attack you at the worst Randomly. possible time. Okay, nice. And it's in those moments <laughs> you can feel your meticulously planned hard fought run teetering on the edge of oblivion. The Crow so works fair. because he is maybe the purest distillation of fear and hunger's cruelty. And it is that cruelty that makes this game what it is. There's even multiple points where the game will just kill you outright for selecting the wrong option, like asking you do you want to climb down a toilet, and if you do, you don't even get a game over, you're just trapped there 
forever. The <laughs> nice. lesson being, don't do that, stupid. And in any other game, this would just feel cheap. But in Fear and Hunger, it's just part of the cruel core that is this game. It Death is, what is, it is always a lesson. And when I started, this all felt so random and pointless and unfair. But the more I played the game, the more I'd hit these points and find myself going back over the choices that had led me there, picking apart what I could have done different, learning from it, and then excited to reapply that knowledge in my next run. That loop is maddeningly addictive. Learning how to engage with Fear and Hunger's world in the way that it's asking you to, that is the true challenge of this game. And it is fucking enthralling. Recently, I started to learn piano. And as I've mentioned before, I get up several mornings a week and cycle through the freezing Dublin air where I learn to pretend murder people in jujitsu. And those are both very technical activities that you slowly get better at by making mistakes. And fear and hunger, it fires my brain in that same way. And combined with the game's atmosphere, its mystique, its feeling of discovering just a little piece more of this nightmare with each run, it makes for a horrifying and captivating experience that I think you should play. But unfortunately, that is a recommendation I'm going to have to temper with some criticisms. Technically, Fear and Hunger is kind of a mess. There's several areas that drag my frame rate into single digits, and one or two points where my game would consistently freeze, killing my <laughs> run. If you don't understand what Fear and Hunger is, it's easy to believe that the game is unfair and random, but these crashes show what actual random unfairness looks like, yep. and it fucking sucks. The caveat here being I was playing mostly on Steam Deck and ran into these issues far less frequently on PC, but it's still a shame. Fear and Hunger is the kind of game that devours plane rides, and while it has the Steam Deck compatibility tick, it probably shouldn't. I can let this go because Fear and Hunger is made by mostly one person, which is a fucking achievement, but my two other issues are less excusable. Fortunately, during the creation of this video, someone actually released a mod that cuts out all the more sensitive content, which, oh boy, would have been handy to have a month ago. But what it means <laughs> is that anyone can now play it as well as the game being fully streamable. And stream it, I shall, over on twitch.tv forward slash super eyepatchwolf this Friday at 1pm EST. And that excites me greatly, because when fear and hunger spins together in just the right way, the emergent narratives it creates are the stuff of pure streaming gold. And it is one of those narratives that I want to end this video on. But before I do, I just want to acknowledge that if you feel like this video has maybe pulled back a few too many of Fear and Hunger's mysteries, its sequel, Fear and Hunger Termina, actually released a sequel. at the end of last year. So here is an entire other bigger game built with the same design ethos for you to just discover for yourself. Now, here is my journey through Fear and Hunger. Against my better judgment, and because I've never really gotten over Casca, I started with the knight, taking advantage of her strong early game, rolling good enough items that let me save the mercenary from the prison, as well as the weird dog from the cave, recruiting both and battling my way through the game's lower floors. And as I did, something started to dawn on me. I knew which fights to take, I knew which to avoid. Every death, every lesson from previous runs, was now materializing in oh, you this meticulously it. laid out plan that was now spinning together into a combination of good fortune and execution that honestly was mildly euphoric as I started to feel like, oh my god, I'm actually doing it. I'm actually going to make it. But there was also something else, dread, knowing that one wrong decision or mistimed button press could You're drag dead. it all crumbling down. My hands were beginning to cramp. I could feel the sweat on my controller as I approached Lagarde's cell with mere moments left on the clock. I was going to do it. The end was finally, oh God, oh Jesus, no. no. I, and still no I managed way. to rescue Lagarde, adrenaline pounding through me as I shot back up through the dungeon's floors, trying to remember what enemies I'd left alive and where, scrambling through its corridors, tense and terrified as the crow mauler never felt more than a few steps away until finally we 
reached the game's opening courtyard, my party beaten and broken and missing limbs, but alive. We had made you it. Did it. And I felt genuine happiness for them. Both they and I had escaped the dungeon of fear and hunger. I had beaten the game. Only... Why did Lagarde go back? What, what? What was that weird moment after you rescue him where he glances up a hallway that we, we don't we don't need to go down? Well, it didn't matter. What matters is I was now free. My life No, is mine no, again no, no, no. Now we need to know. Now we need to know. The grass and we must. the supermarket. Maybe if I cook a delicious enough meal, my wife will come back no 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 i don't want to go play back again. no 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 i began a new playthrough of fear and hunger and the class i picked was the dark priest oh god Damn it. Okay, the Dark Priest is the worst character in the game until you realize that you can use necromancy to resurrect ghouls and skeletons who join your party, fitting them out with all the armor and nice. weapons you are too weak to carry. But the real brain explosion moment came when I entered an altar and was given the unusual option to show love, show love to my zombie servants. They started what? to liquefy merging ceasing to be two separate beings but becoming one marriage the brand new character class who could use the spells of the necromancer wield the armor and weapons of the knight with an even greater offense than the outlander able to break down doors in a single swing okay basically the best class unstoppable using everything i'd learned to lay waste to this dungeon that same euphoria roaring back but stronger now again i rescued lagarde but this time i went north at the place he hesitated only to be met with a giant locked door but how how do i get it wait a minute I had never figured out what that strange artifact was in the weird racist village from a previous run. And maybe, <laughs> yes, yes, unload your secrets upon me, game. And here I would come to learn something terrifying. This was Fear and Hunger's half waypoints. What? Once again, I watched as the game destroyed my expectations of it. Because you see, somehow, beneath everything else I had overcome was now a giant ancient city filled with the carcasses of gods and enemies so unfathomable and terrifying. I died over and over and over, yet... I could not stop. Over and over, I hurled myself against this place, but it was never enough. My party was not strong enough. I became obsessed, crawling through my memories of this game, desperate for something, anything. And that's when I remembered that door in the basement oh. at the beginning of the game. What had it said? What type of key did I You need to kill the crow, I guess. Need? Oh Jesus! Yep. Oh god no! Not that! The Anything but that! Anything but him! <laughs> After many hours of experimenting, I defeated the crow mauler. I claimed my prize of the miasma sword, a blade so powerful that it threatened to drive my party insane. And still, its power was not enough. Still, the game rejected me, and that's when it happened. See, remember that floating head encounter at the beginning of the game? This is Nashra, and I developed quite Imagine a recruiting him. for him. Whenever I'd get the Gore Corridor cutscene, I'd return to him, trying to glean what little information I could before being crushed to death. But that's when I discovered that by carrying the Cube of the Depths as well as the Eclipse Talisman obtained by talking to the Eastern Priests, 
Nashra can join your party. Yep. And so with him, combined with the strength of the Miasma Sword, combined with the strength of marriage, I smashed my way through to the end game. I lay siege to the ancient city, decapitating its gods, emptying it of its secrets, until I stood before the throne of ascension, facing its final god in one last Lastless. terrible battle where all my party members were killed and me without healing items and only two HP remaining, I struck the final blow. I sat upon the throne of ascension. I had done it. I had beaten fear and What? The game was not over. <laughs> no. I was transported to some ancient primordial and terrifying place with two HP left. by things beyond human experience i i stumbled blindly and in fear once again the game reduced me to a small terrified coward this playthrough had lasted nearly three hours i was exhausted but surely just a just a little more and i could be free of this awful place and that's when i stood before some ancient glowing abyss when out of it rose it some impossible eldritch being older than time older than space more powerful than both and i knew this was it this is the final one this was the game's Definitely. final boss and beyond it lay freedom and so with the knowledge of everything i had lost every death that had oh, come you just have two me, hp you can't do I shit stepped forward <laughs> and faced this impossible god in a primordial battle that would determine both our <laughs> Yep. Fear and hunger. So, why put yourself through this? Why put yourself through the misery and pain and agony of this game? Well, I feel like the easy answer here would be to say it's the satisfaction of overcoming something difficult. But honestly, I think it's more than that. When I first started playing Fear and Hunger, it didn't just feel hard, it felt like chaos. Death felt immediate and random and unfair. But after spending dozens of hours with this game, well, honestly, it still kind of feels that way. The feeling I have isn't mastery, but something else. Survival. The feeling of adapting of taking this game's bullshit of every unfair and cruel thing it will do to you and enduring, of looking at your situation, your resources, your actual options and using them to carve a path forward. And if it doesn't work, well, you learn what you can and you do better next time. Cause that's kind of how fucking life is, right? Yeah. You're fine and the next you're not. You get hurt, you lose something, your wife leaves you, or someone you love gets So there's no ending to this game. There's no reason to it. Even with that optimal run, you can't do shit, I guess. This is just what your life is now. And it's easy to fall into despair. It's easy to feel like you have no options. But what you can do is try. Is look at your situation, look at the resources you do have, and adapt and learn from it. Try and make today better than the one that came before. I don't know that there's any other medium that could give me that feeling besides video games, and Fear and Hunger uses that. This simulated experience of suffering, of pain, of losing things and surviving. So yeah, this game is cruel. It is unfair. It will make you want to stop going. Chances are, life will do those things as well. But there is always the same something thing. you can learn. There's always something you can take away from those experiences and grow from it. 
And I think that's what's beautiful about Fear and Hunger. It's a game about moving forward in that cruelty and surviving regardless. Friends, thank you for joining me today. As ever, be sure to nice. check out iPatchWolves.com to pick up some iPatchWolves merch. And also to subscribe to my page. Yeah. Go support him. He definitely deserves it. And I would also really appreciate a like, sub, and a comment as well. Like, damn. But it was video was very, very good. Go like his stuff. Go subscribe to him. And yeah. As I, as I said earlier, I would also appreciate the support. And I guess that's it. I guess see you next time. Wafer out.